Good afternoon, everyone. This is not just another conference strung together for just pulling a crowd for some odd reason. It has a very definitive purpose. And the purpose is to make a clarion call that look people, look parents, look citizens. The child of tomorrow needs to be prepared perhaps differently from the child of yesterday. And unless we make some fundamental changes in our thinking and in the ways we treat our children, it's not going to automatically happen. Yes, life will perhaps continue. And as a lot of people say, what's the problem? What's wrong with the way things keep going on? But I think what will you miss out perhaps is on the great opportunity which is there in front of us is to really unleash the potential of a very large number of children, not only in our country, but all over the world. I also think that today is an important day because the clarion call we are making is not only for our own children, it is for all children. One of the highly simplistic divisions, and simplistic divisions are dangerous, but this one is useful in my view. Kishore Bayani, the very famous retailer, says that India is not one India, but there are three Indias. There is India one, which is sitting in this room. People like us, with our kind of children. There is India three, the poorest of the poor, the destitute India, probably take a couple of generations for them to come anywhere close to the privilege we have. But the one, the India I would like to dedicate this afternoon to is India 2. The one which sits between these two. The India of the people who are not in this room but just outside. The maids, the drivers, the watchmen, the blue collar workers, the people who brought us here, who take us back, the rickshaw wala, the auto wala. This is a very, very large India. And they are within touching distance of this kind of world. And a decade and a half of good education could make all the difference. And a lot of what you will hear today would be from that perspective, not of extremes of extreme privilege or the extreme of extreme poverty, but this very large center which our India is carrying but not giving enough to those children. How will these children be served? Based on my own experience over the last seven years of working in education, I think whatever we do, we need to keep three groups in mind. The first, all the education entrepreneurs who are sitting in this room. The most underestimated and perhaps the most under-respected entrepreneurial group in the country. I think the story of what it has taken over the last half a century for India to get to where it has gotten, not enough credit has been given to the private school effort. And I'm not talking about rich private schools. I mean, there are probably 500 or 1,000 of those. We're talking about the hundreds and thousands of schools now which have reached small towns and villages. I think that needs to be saluted. And I see that in the eyes of the people I meet and in the schools I go to. And I think maybe India needs to shift in its notion that making money while teaching is a bad thing or an evil thing. Extreme of any kind is bad. But I think if people make a good day's living because they're doing good work, it's perhaps something we need to revisit. I was at a dinner last night where I met a very interesting person, the person who runs Penguin in India. And he said he's been in Delhi for a few years, but he's been coming to India for the last two decades. So I said, oh, great, Mike. So what do you see has changed in India over the last two decades? He said, confidence. So the most visible difference of coming to India is the confidence. You meet people and the feeling you get is the way America was probably in the 1890s. The feeling you get is, I can do it. And to me, this group of education entrepreneurs stands for that kind of attitude. 
I can do it. No government support, very diff difficult business model, hard to manage ends, hard to find teachers, but I will go on, on, on and make it work somehow. And the motive has to be a little bit more than making money. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. The second group I want to salute and I think we need to keep in our mind is the teachers of India. I returned to India after doing whatever I did with starry eyes and wanting to change the world and with a sharp tongue. And one of the things which came easy to me, which comes to a lot of people, is to criticize teachers and what's wrong with them. Till one day I ended up in a small school in southern Karnataka and I walked into this class 3 classroom and they were taking me around as Harvard Gardner student and saying, oh, he went to Harvard and all of that. And this 22-year-old girl who barely spoke English gave me the chalk and said, sir, can you teach this lesson better than me? Every color that is conceivable crossed my face. And that's the day I decided that I need to enter the classroom and that changed everything. Which is when I met the education minister, Mr. Sibyl, I said, Mr. Sibyl, one thing you do, get into the classroom. Otherwise, you have no idea what you're talking about. And I suddenly realized for me to teach a 45-minute period well was hard work. None of the big names, Harvard University doesn't come to rescue you, your beard doesn't come to rescue you, you may be some fancy person somewhere. It's very hard. And I had colleagues, women teaching eight periods, nine periods, ten periods, they had probably fought with their mother-in-law in the morning, taken the bus to work, go back and cook, three kids to take care of. And in spite of all my motivation, I frankly did not know what was happening to more than half the children in my class. So I think what teachers need is support and help and specific tools that can work in the classroom. Everything else is, thank you very much, we've heard this before. Finally, I think it's hard to remember when you're doing something hard, and all of you are, and I certainly am. Every cell in my body knows I'm doing something very hard. Is to keep in mind why are you doing it in the first place. And that's for the children of our country and of the world. I think it's highly appropriate that we've chosen Dr. Gardner to speak tonight, not only because we know him, but also because I think his thoughts have been the most defining thoughts, at least the ones I'm aware of, of including all children in the business of success, in the business of learning. And not just the five who sit in the front bench and say, ma'am, 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 not just the ones who live in nice places or come from privileged homes, not only those who are able to speak English in an articulate fashion, but all children. And unless there is specific tools and resources and processes and systems and commitment to including all children, I don't think we are going to go that far. I'm not a follower of Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, but I sometimes read his quotations. He says, uh, love is, you know, love is a word which is overused and under understood. Love is when you don't see anything wrong with someone. If somebody says he is like that or she is like that, you say, so what? Others also do something like this. I think if you think about it, maybe tonight, tomorrow morning, you may have an insight like I did. I think that's a very useful insight to think about children. And I wish all our children could have a future where people would say, there's nothing wrong with him. Others do it, so what? He also does it. And true love for the child is the beginning of possibility. So here's to creating schools for tomorrow where every child can be loved. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm honored by your presence.